Good morning, everyone. I'm delighted that you're here. It is uh, my great honor to introduce Rick Kaplan. Uh, it's not very often that you can say that somebody has won 47 Emmys and six DuPonts. He was the president of CNN, of MSNBC, and ran the, uh, he was a producer at ABC for 20 years. He produced Nightline, World News Tonight, this week, Good Morning America News. Uh, he produced Walter Cronkite, what an amazing career. Um, Peter Jennings, Diane Sawyer, Barbara Walters. I think this is going to be a very interesting 90 minutes. I'd like to introduce Rick Kaplan. Good morning. Thank you, Paige. Normally, when uh, someone gets a wonderful introduction, like or wonderful things are said about somebody, they end by saying, and we'll miss him. <laughs> Hopefully, that, that won't be the case. I'm, I'm very honored, very honored to have been asked here today. And I'd like to thank the National Council on US-Arab Relations, and especially Dr. John Duke Anthony, its founder, and Pat Mancino for the invitation. This is my 50th year working as a journalist, and every decade has been marked and often dominated by stories from the Middle East, many hopeful, many more tragic, and often we see people on all sides talking past each other. My introduction to the region is when I went there during the 73 war. I've been fascinated by the Middle East ever since. In its vision statement, this council recognizes the need <clears throat> for a mutual respect for each other's heritage and values, an overall acceptance of each other's legitimate needs, <clears throat> concerns, interests, and objectives. The word legitimate, this is where often the two sides, the many sides, conflict. I think Scheherazade would be hard pressed to limit her reporting of today's stories to merely 1,001 nights. But we're going to try to bring some reason and understanding and possibly some policy recommendations to you in the next 90 minutes or so. And I have a wonderful group to help me uh, this morning. Please, well, we're missing some of our people, so I'll, I'll introduce the ones who are here. <clears throat> Others will join in the course of this morning. So I'd like to introduce the founder and executive chairman of the Beirut Institute and a columnist for the National, Rashida, Rashida, Rahida Dershan. She said that to me 16 times this morning. And I know her for years, and I've never gotten that right. If she looks familiar, Rahida, Rahida has been a frequent contributor on all the cable networks and a really respected strate uh, strategist on global affairs. The, uh, and last but not least, a New York Times op-ed columnist and Pulitzer Prize winning reporter and commentator, and one journalist who um, I and all of my colleagues made sure to read before beginning every workday. We are thrilled to welcome Tom Friedman. Now the process we're going to follow is that we're going to ask our panelists to open with a brief, relatively, statement uh, open, and, and then we'll open it up for a dialogue. You should find note cards um, at your tables, and we ask you to write down any questions that you would like to have included in our conversation, which the staff will collect throughout the session, and I'll direct the questions as I see fit, and we'll mix them into the session. Now, it's hoped that our panel will also have some policy recommendations to share as we conclude. Now, we have less than 90 minutes, so we must uh, use our time wisely and end on time since it'll affect the rest of the day here. So to begin, 
May I ask Rahita <laughs> Magrub to please come up? Good morning, everybody. So for those who speak Arabic, they will uh, sing my name. It's Raghida Dergham. So think how lovely it is in Arabic. It gets butchered, Raghida, Rashida, etc. But uh, it's uh, an honor, actually, to be serious, to be with you, Rick. And Dr. John Duke Anthony, you have always honored me by inviting me to this wonderful conference. Thank you for that. And I have multiple plays, uh, roles to play. And I also want to express to my friend Tom Friedman, with whom I have had a wonderful, long, professional relationship for over like 30 years. And, uh, and uh, yes, I do. I do think that his column is a must read. Rick, I worked for you many, many times, but you don't you, you know, you were somewhere above my performance. Uh, uh, I, was, I was MSNBC uh, uh, political analyst for a couple of years, but I started really with Nightline. So this is how old I am, so that's fine. <laughs> All right, so I know, I know everyone here is interested in what's going on uh, in uh, the Middle East. If I were to tell you about everything that's going on, I think we would spend a full day doing so. So I cannot get into the details of the important events in Sudan, in Algeria, in Tunisia, and what's going on in Egypt. Uh, it's, it's, it's really a place where it has, news goes on uh, very much so, although it's not covered in American media. So I think the preoccupation these days may be uh, due to that, I will limit myself to three areas, Turkey and Syria, Iran, and Lebanon. And I'll be very brief and very quick if I can. Uh, as long as um, uh, the president of Turkey, Recep Tayyip Erdogan, feels so good as he would this morning, I think we shall remain confused about what the Trump administration's policy produced uh, in Syria uh, over the last months. So uh, if you read the papers today, you will find out that uh, Erdogan was uh, meeting with the, uh, the president of uh, Russia, Vladimir Putin, and um, they cemented each other's gains in Syria. The loser remains the, the Kurds, of course. But again, we uh, wonder quite often these days, what is the Trump's administration's end game in Syria? As it looks, uh, in fact, to me, it looks like, despite all the threats to Erdogan, do this or you, you, know, you will not get uh, uh, anywhere, including his challenges to uh, uh, NATO, in effect, uh, he is, uh, Turkey is a NATO member, and yet Turkey had gone ahead and defied all the threats about the S-400, um, which is, you know, how are you? Which, uh, uh, which means, uh, which was really, you know, objected to by the United States, and yet uh, Erdogan went ahead and insisted that he would go ahead with the purchase of the S-400 uh, from Russia. And despite all that, what we hear is uh, there is lifting of sanctions. There will be no sanctions. He will be received in the White House. And uh, we hear about things um, related to the Kurds that, you know, we never promised them a rose garden, uh, although really they did fight very much with us uh, on our behalf against ISIS. So I want to just leave the Turkish situation uh, for a further question and answer period. But I just wanted to say, for the moment, Erdogan looks like the winner, and so does uh, Vladimir Putin. Uh, where, and I think also Iran is a big benefactor, uh, has, has benefited tremendously from the American withdrawal from Syria, because the former policy, I don't know what is the current policy now, the former policy was that no, the United States will not allow Iran to cement its gains in Syria. Uh, and. We don't know what happened to that policy. I don't know if it's still active. I don't know if there is uh, any easing or any you know, back-channel understanding uh, regarding Iran's role in Syria. But let me go to Iran quickly, because I, will don't, I don't want Rick to stand up and tell me your, your time is up. Uh, on, on, on Iran, um, you know, it's, it's a very interesting message we've been getting from Iran. 
uh, as you heard, I am the founder and executive chairman of Beirut Institute, and we had a summit in Abu Dhabi last week that put together a lot of great minds from all over the world, from the United States, from Washington and New York, as well as from Russia, China, Europe, uh, Middle East, including Iran. So, and the message that we heard uh, was very interesting. It came indirect to, to us uh, through many different players, but it, uh, it's, it's the following, that the Revolutionary Guards would like you to know that they are very much interested in a dialogue, and they think that a dialogue with them is much more useful than one with President Rouhani or, uh, or the Foreign Minister Jawad Zarif. And they think uh, the, the message is that you really need to talk to the deep state. And uh, it's like you know, they're proud that they are the deep state. And uh, the message is that uh, if you keep painting Iran in a corner, well, guess what? What you don't like now is going to get worse. So it's really a very threatening, uh, defiant message that says, in effect, um, Iran's very raison d'etre, you know, the existence of this regime is on the basis that it will not be satisfied within its own borders, that it will go on with its expansionist policy, because without it, such regime does not have its raison d'etre. So the message was live with it, uh, be obedient, understand that you're gonna, you know, Iran will be always outside its own borders, whether it's in Lebanon, whether it's in, uh, in, in Yemen, in Syria, and Iraq. And uh, the reason why you need to live with it is because once you paint the revolutionary guards in a corner, they're gonna come back at you by ruling very hard and very openly in Iran and by, um, by uh, opera uh, through operations such as the tankers, going against the tankers once again, somebody said within two weeks actually, from now that they plan to do such an attack and through their own bases uh, where their paramilitary forces are. Iran is the only country I know in the world that demands respect and recognition of its policy, that uh, it, it, has a, it proclaims its right, and I put this in, in, in quotation, to have military, uh, paramilitary forces that belong to Iran in sovereign countries. I don't know of any other country that uh, requires uh, the, the world community to, to, to respect uh, such a, an amazing uh, defiance of sovereignty. So um, I, the, the thing is that when we are told that in, within the next month, that is the second part of November, um, the Revolutionary Guards feel that things are going to get very bad within Iran. That means that they are going to have to do something about the internal situation that is exploding and that is imploding, and therefore they need to be aggressive outside in order to rally the na nationalism inside Iran. So I think there will be more operations, uh, and I think uh, we're told that we better not uh, you know, underestimate the power of the Revolutionary Guards. Should you paint them in a corner, they're going to get angry and they're going to get back to you with several things, including, you know, we were told, potential withdrawal from NPT. At which point, this is the question, the policy for the U.S. What, is, what are the red lines by the uh, Trump administration? Should there be clearer red lines? We know only of the red line that um, and that uh, you know, don't touch American soldiers, but are there other, is, there, is withdrawal from NPT a clear red line? What about uh, further operations against uh, the partners in the region? Quickly on Lebanon, because I don't want to miss this opportunity, and I would like to elaborate on this a lot a little later. Lebanon is going through a, trans, a, a transformational awakening. This is the first time that you see, I just came from Beirut, and I came from the square where people, really there was a million people demonstrating. They, they, they were demonstrating in Beirut and in Tyre where the Shiites and, uh, are and Nabati, and they were demonstrating in Tripoli where the Sunnis are. They came from everywhere to go against sectarianism, against the ruling, fam uh, the ruling uh, uh, group of, uh, I mean, they became a family almost scratching each other's backs, the ruling elite, and then they really are demanding the withdrawal, uh, the actual 
um, uh, uh, for the government to, to resign and a new arrangement to be made, not the one that is now between Prime Minister Saad al-Hariri and Hezbollah and Jubran Basil, who is the foreign minister and uh, uh, the son-in-law of the president. I know that I should end now, but I hope that you give me the opportunity to tell you more about Lebanon during the question answer. I thank you very much. There is a lot to say. Um, and as promised, we have been joined by another one of our panelists, um, Ms. Kirsten Fontenrose. She is the director of the Atlantic Council's Middle East program <clears throat> and a former White House National Security Council senior director for Gulf Affairs. And I would ask you, if you to make some opening remarks. Right, I'm also a former National Council on U.S. Arab Relations alum, so it uh, all comes full circle. I want to be a little bit provocative this morning, and since I do come out of the administration at the end of last year, I can shed a little bit of light. Um, as Mona touched on, as I'm sure others will touch on during the day, the U.S. administration's objectives in the region are seemingly paradoxical right now. On the one hand, the president is looking to reduce the U.S. footprint and resources dedicated to the region, and on the other hand, He's looking to mitigate or manage the influence and expanding entrenchment of China, Iran, and Russia in the region. Recently, that has manifested itself in several potentially confusing policies, like the withdrawal from northeastern Syria, like the limited, aka cyber-only, reaction to the attack on Abqaiq, to non-engagement in Libya, and refusal to engage with Hezbollah-aligned or Iranian-backed components of governments like uh, parts of Lebanon and, and Iraq. So these moves to disengage or not engage at all have caused the region to question the U.S.'s commitment uh, right now. But I'm going to ask us to look at it a slightly different way. The decisions leading to this assumption are all rooted in an avoidance of armed conflict. That's what you're hearing from the president's campaign commitments. You also heard this from the previous three administrations' campaign commitments. What we're not used to is a president coming in and really following through with that. Usually the president comes in and sees realities on the ground and chooses to stay engaged in conflicts he may not like when he entered office. This one is doing something slightly different. But there are indicators that still point to significant, solid, and ongoing US commitment to the region in, place, in areas like training and capacity building, interoperability, CT and information sharing in the intel sector, trade and investment, and support for reforms initiated by the regime in good governance, in justice, and finance, kind of across the region. So we do find really positive indicators of US commitment. We're just not looking at them right now when we're panicked about what this means for the future of Syria and the future role of the US in the region, watching what's happening uh, up in the Northeast there. For one tangible sign of commitment, simply look to troop sizes the US has on the ground, since everyone turns to security for a signal. In NATO, we've got about 35,000 troops on the ground, according to numbers that were covered by the New York Times and the open source this week. Out in the region, we've got in the Gulf alone between 45 and 65,000. That's not counting US troops in Afghanistan or Iraq. Another tangible sign, the US uh, president advocated for the Middle East Strategic Alliance, or what many of us would call a concept of MESA, in multiple speeches at the UN General Assembly this year. Secretary Pompeo held a margin meeting specifically on MESA at UNGA. Uh, the National Security Council convenes meetings roughly every other week with the interagency on MESA and with partners around the region every few months. So this concept is very much alive. And the push to establish this architecture with economic security and energy components is a strong indication of the US intent to remain engaged and strengthen this engagement. The obstacles to MESA, interestingly, are predominantly disagreements among regional countries themselves, not the commitment from the US to this idea. In evaluating the US administration's decisions in the region, it's helpful to remember that the president uh, decides about any conflict, whether he's in it or, or not, 
based on a cost benefit analysis. That's kind of how his brain works. So economic threats from places like China are considered far more potentially catastrophic than kinetic threats, like what might be seen in, in northeastern Syria. Everything is fairly short term. We're looking at an election cycle. So he's not looking at um, sort of the strategy of long term planning or what this might mean 20, 50, 100 years from now. He's looking more at what this means for my election uh, potential and the happiness of my military and my troops right now. Uh, it's not a cause for despair. It simply means that adaptations are necessary and we need to kind of think about new approaches to how to frame policy recommendations when you're speaking with this administration, whether it's for one more year or five more years. To this end, I propose a few, uh, few recommendations for our discussions today and for your consideration. First, the Middle East, Europe, Asian partners and the U.S. Uh, should proactively draft coordinated strategies for engagement in countries in turmoil or transition, like Libya, Yemen, Lebanon, Iraq, maybe Sudan, maybe Somalia, and follow this up with implementation plans as specific as possible. This will prevent these transitioning countries from continuing to be vivisected by the competing interests of external actors, and it will encourage greater U.S. involvement when the U.S. sees this burden sharing from around the region. My second recommendation is to go ahead and follow through with the Middle East Strategic Alliance. Establish MESA. Take advantage of the opportunity to put in place a structure that will outlast this president, future administrations, and any executive orders. Create something that will incentivize governments who are currently right now looking outside the region for political direction to come back into the Arab fold and use MESA to achieve the collective security capabilities and resilience of the region that we're looking for and become a powerful block that is a force to be reckoned with on the, on the global stage. Third, I would say um, to the region, if you would um, think about working with us and with other partners to develop a cadre of mid-level policymakers. This sounds really administrative and boring, but I speak from experience spending my entire career in the US government in positions related to the Middle East and as was mentioned most recently at the White House. Part of the challenge the US and others have in designing and influencing strategies together with the Arab world is the lack of kind of a professional action officer, the boring folks in the middle, all of us, cadre of experienced, trained, policymakers, folks who know the art and science of collaborating with interministerials and developing coordinated coalesced recommendations for their senior leaders that can be taken up to heads of state. So without this, it means that heads of state in the region don't always get what, what could be the best sort of most thought through, most full scope policy options, and the, and the head of state isn't getting that from his, his cabinet. So if, if the region could think about something really mundane like this and work with all of us on it, we'd be happy to assist with building out a really professional core of policymakers for, for the future. And the last thing I would recommend is that we all devise ways in which Europe, the Arab world, the US, Asian partners, can collaborate more specifically to counter the entrenchment of Russia, the IRGC specifically, not the Iranian people, and China in the region. Because if the international community is, is not okay with China monopolizing the world's mineral resources and bribing developing world leaders into leveraging the country's futures, and if we're not okay with Russia selling weapons to anyone who will buy them with no restrictions on usage, and if we're not okay with the IRGC using violence against regional neighbors and fragile governments to prevent regional stability, then we need to be coming up with new options for that. When we go at it unilaterally or even bilaterally, we're not as strong as if we present these adversaries with agreed upon positions. This can take many forms that we can talk about perhaps in Q&A, but I leave you with those thoughts and I welcome your recommendations on any of those. Thanks very much. And before we finally get to our conversation, I would like to introduce Tom Friedman. Thank you, Rick. Uh, it's a treat to be here this morning. John, thank you for inviting me and uh, being on this panel. Um, uh, I think maybe the thing I can contribute uh, most uh, uh, by way of introduction is uh, since we're here talking about the Arab world, um, the Arab world is part of the world, and uh, I'd like to share with you my thoughts on actually what are the biggest global trends right now that are impacting the region, because I think they're also impacting uh, the whole world. So um, the way I look at the world right now is I believe we're in the middle of actually three climate changes at once. We're in the middle of three 
uh, nonlinear accelerations with the three largest forces on the planet, which I call the market, Mother Nature, and Moore's Law. So uh, Mother Nature is, uh, is uh, climate change, biodiversity loss, and population growth in the developing world. If you put Mother Nature on a graph, she looks like a giant accelerating hockey stick. Uh, the market for me is globalization, but not your grandfather's globalization. That was containers on ships and planes. What's globalizing the world today is actually digital globalization, where everything's being digitized and globalized. Put it on a graph, it looks like another accelerating hockey stick. And lastly, um, uh, Moore's Law, uh, which is technology, that the speed and power of microchips uh, keep doubling every 24 months. Put it on a graph, it looks like another accelerating hockey stick. The world is being reshaped today by these three interconnected accelerations, and they're all feeding off each other. So the way I like to look at it is we're actually in the middle of three climate changes at once. We're in the middle of change of the climate of the climate. Uh, we're going from what I call later to now. Uh, later uh, was when I was growing up in Minnesota in the 1950s and 60s. Later was when I could clean that river, purify that lake, rescue that orangutan. I could do it now or I could do it later. Uh, today, later is officially over. Later will now be too late. So whatever you're going to save, please save it now. That is a climate change. We're in the middle of change of the climate of globalization. We're going from an interconnected world to an interdependent world. And that's a very different world. In an interdependent world, first of all, your friends can kill you faster than your enemies. If Greek and Italian banks had gone under last night, um, uh, John may have called me and said, Tom, I'm sorry, uh, we have to cancel the conference. I would have said, John, Gre Gre Greece, Italy, they're, they're allies. They're in NATO. They're in the EU. But in an interdependent world, they can kill us. And in an interdependent world, your rival falling actually becomes more dangerous than your rival rising. If uh, China had taken six more islands in the South China Sea last night, personally, don't tell anybody, I couldn't have cared less. Had China lost 6% growth last night, John definitely would have called me and said, this conference has to be postponed. That is a climate change. And lastly, we're going through a change in the climate of technology. Um, every company today can, and therefore must, sensorize, that is capture all its data around its business, then analyze that data, optimize off that data, prophesize off that data, customize off that data, localize off that data, and digitize and automatize off all that data. Put that together, every business in the world is going through a climate change. We're going through three climate changes at once. What do you want when the climate changes? You want two things. You want resilience. You need to be able to take a blow because stuff happens. Um, and at the same time, you want propulsion. You want to be able to move ahead. You don't be curled up under the table with me saying, John, come out come out, the climate change is over. So every country in the world today is actually looking for those two things, actually every company and every community, resilience and propulsion. Now let's bring it to the Middle East. How does this affect the region and how does it manifest itself in the region? So um, the world was governed actually for millennia, actually by empires. Uh, the Byzantine Empire, the Mughal Empire, the Greek Empire, the Roman Empire, we know all their, all their names. And it was really only in the 19th century and the 20th century with decolonization and the end of World War I and World War II that we actually chopped up the world into 192 nation states. So in 1945, we woke up and we discovered a UN with 192 countries. The 50 years between World War II and um, uh, the early uh, 21st century were a fantastic time to be a weak little state. If you were a weak little state, that was your era. Why? Well, first of all, there were two superpowers out there who were um, competing for your affection as part of their global competition, throwing money at you, uh, building your government house, building your army, sending you wheat, um, uh, educating your kids at Patrice Lumumba University in Moscow or Wichita State in America. You could be Syria and Israel and fight three wars together and get your armies rebuilt basically for free all three times. Number two, climate change was very moderate. Number three, populations were under control. And number four, China was not in the World Trade Organization. So every country in the Middle East could have a textile business. Now my argument is that in the early 21st century, in the, as a result of these three accelerations, these three climate change, the whole world around the Middle East has flipped. And what it's done is created a whole new set of pressures where average is over. 
Your ability to just be an average little country today is over. Why? First of all, the superpower competition is over. We're living that moment right now. Yes, Russia is involved in Syria, but that's actually an anomaly. The fact is, no superpower basically wants to touch you anymore because they think all they win is a bill. That's what Trump is telling you. Number two, climate change is hammering these countries, and ground zero is actually the Arab world. If you look at what's going on uh, on average temperatures in the region, everyone knows water is drying up. Lake Ermia in Iran has basically disappeared. Um, and populations have doubled uh, in a lot of these capitals now. So Mother Nature is pounding this region. Um, third, uh, as I say, populations have, have increased. Uh, and, and lastly, uh, China's in the World Trade Organization. So nobody else can be in the textile business. So what these pressures are doing is suddenly these three climate changes are putting such pressure on states that the weakest of them are beginning to fracture. We toppled a couple ourselves, <clears throat> Afghanistan and Iraq. Others are blowing up just fine on their own. And the states that are blowing up first are those whose borders are primarily straight lines. Beware of living in any country whose borders have right angles and straight lines because they are the most frail, fragile, and artificial and an age of three climate changes at once, they're gonna be the most endangered. And so what we're seeing is the weakest of these states are beginning to fracture and hemorrhage their people and create a vast movement of people on the world stage from the world of disorder, trying to get into the world of order. In our hemisphere, it's coming from Central America and in the hemisphere across the ocean, it's coming from Africa and the Arab world. And that, I believe, is the context within which all of this is happening today. Thank you. All right, so now it's your turn. And we'll be answering a number of your questions. And to facilitate time, I would ask our panel to be brief as you can, intellectually. And you can stay in your seats and you have a microphone there. Just make sure it's pointed at you so it works. And I want to begin, being an American, since this is Washington, I want to begin with Syria. And what we see is a great advantage being taken by Russia and Syria and Iran and ISIS because of what is perceived to be an American betrayal of the Kurds. And the questions are, where do you see this going? And can the United States ever regain the trust of any country that might want to make a deal with us? And why don't I start with Tom? Uh, well, I wrote about this this morning. Um, so it's kind of fresh on my mind. Uh, I have a lot of different reactions, Rick. I, I would simply say, um, one shouldn't overreact and one shouldn't underreact. So let's, let's talk about overreaction. Russia won Syria. What is second prize? I mean, what, what, what have they actually won? They, they've, they've won the opportunity now to manage um, uh, what is an utterly chaotic and fractured situation. So I'd be very careful about exaggerating you know, what, what they've won. But um, at the same time, the flip side of that is that, so I, I think to think about this problem uh, effectively, you have to, uh, I think, uh, think about a couple things. One is the context of ISIS in Iraq and the context of ISIS in Syria. Uh, the war against ISIS in Iraq, paradoxically and unexpectedly, actually led to greater power sharing in Iraq, which is the central ingredient um, for Iraq stabilizing and uh, pulling together as some kind of effective consensual government. Because basically, when um, presented with the, the lethal threat of ISIS, what it actually produced was finally um, much more consensus uh, between Kurds, Sunnis, and Shia in Iraq. Uh, it produced a, 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 a better governance. And it, the war against ISIS in Iraq turned out to be the war of national liberation for this generation of Iraqis. 
And out of it has come, I think, much better governance and actual power sharing. Um, the war against ISIS in Syria actually worked against power sharing. Uh, because basically, um, when we took responsibility with the Kurds for destroying ISIS in Syria, we gave a free hand to Russia, Iran, and Hezbollah to crush all of the rebel forces there, both the Islamist ones and the more moderate, uh, moderate and democratic ones. So by not making the distinction between uh, the war of ISIS in Iraq and the war of ISIS in Syria, um, I think we made a huge uh, strategic error. Um, and did the work of Iran, Hezbollah, um, and Russia. And we even, even better, we did it for free, okay? We actually did it for free. It was one of the, I think, biggest, and it was by way a bipartisan, it's not just on Trump, it was a bipartisan strategic error. Because we got caught up, we put the war on terrorism on autopilot. The last thing I would say, um, <clears throat> uh, I feel terrible about the Kurds, I feel terrible about the, the shameful um, abandonment of them, um, uh, uh, not only because of that act in and of itself, but because one of the things that I've really come to think about how we interact with the Arab world, uh, with the world in general, but the Arab world in particular, is um, uh, I'm cert certainly out of the nation building business, okay? Um, uh, and that whole strategy of, uh, 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 of the early 21st century. But what I'm really into is amplification. Uh, where I see a decency, I want to amplify it. Um, uh, and where I see decency anywhere in the region, I want to amplify it. I want to amplify universities. I want to amplify education. And one thing I think about the Kurds is they are and have built islands of decency. Um, and uh, I think those are precisely the forces and regions we should be amplifying uh, and not abandoning. So uh, that's kind of how I quickly see the situation. Rarida. <laughs> okay, yes. uh, okay, I want to add, uh, really, I, don't, I have nothing to contradict. I think this, this being on this side is rather funny, but anyway. Uh, I, don't, I, don't, I want just simply to add uh, to what Tom said um, the following. Yes, uh, Rush, Russia has won uh, the, the case now in Syria, but yes, the issue, the potential of the quagmire in, persists really, and probably uh, if you look at, at the approval rate of Putin's war, uh, Putin's role in Syria, uh, if you take a look at the figures coming from his own country, you'll see that uh, you know it's down to 12 percent from 67 percent or something. So they, he really needs to have the settlement, the political settlement in Syria, and what he has on the table is the so-called Astana process, which is, of course, Russia, um, <clears throat> Turkey, Iran, in, in, in collaboration with the, the government or regime in, in Damascus. So, uh, yeah, it is too soon. And, and what, you know, with, to, to declare, to say that uh, Bashar al-Assad won is really a very funny thing to say when you take a look at a country that part of it is under Turkish control, another part is under the control of Russia, and uh, where Iran will not so far has not budged from its project, uh, the project that is referred to as uh, the crescent, uh, the, the, the passage, which takes Iran from Tehran all the way to the Mediterranean through Iraq and particularly Syria. This is important. So the administration needs to think about that. Are they going to allow, is this administration going to turn a blind eye? on what Iran is doing in Syria. Okay, I could see that there is right now uh, you know, sort of a nod to Putin. Go ahead, it's yours. You, you know, you want to fix it, fine, but if, if, it, if you break it, you own it. You know, I could see that this is what they're saying to Putin, and that's what they're saying also to Erdogan. I think this is the message to Erdogan. Go ahead, you know, you've got your 20 kilometers in, into the, the territories. How long do you stay? It depends, you know, you, you know, we will, uh, we will see if, um, you know, we'll make sure that Bashar al-Assad sort of does not object too much. But absent in this whole debate is where is Iran and Hezbollah, of course. That is an essential matter, I think, as a recommendation I'd like to put to the administration. Tell us what is it that you want and what are the parameters that you have regarding Iran's role in Syria, of course, which means it, 
it, it, it is within the project of the Islamic Republic of Iran to go through Syria in order to connect with Hezbollah in Lebanon and therefore get to the Mediterranean, and that means you know Israel right, right, you know, right, right across the border. So Syria is, is not, the issue of Syria is not over yet, but the worry is that this administration will probably, hopefully not repeat what the previous administration, uh, the Obama administration has done, which is to deliberately turn a blind eye on Syria and really, unfortunately, uh, look away when a genocide was taking place. Thank you. Kirsten, before you begin, let me uh, interject a question from the audience. How will religious extremism represented by Al-Qaeda and the Islamic State evolve in the next several years given their respective requirement to constantly communicate with followers and conduct attacks on soft targets in the West and in Arab states. If you can shift into that. Well, I certainly don't think that pulling out of Syria has made it any tougher for them. Um, I, I, you know, what we're, what we're looking at in terms of that question is, is the formation of kind of a virtual caliphate. We expect them to use the, the international disappointment in the U.S. over this over this withdrawal to catalyze some support among folks who might have thought they were, you know, going underground or, or taking a hit. They have territorially. They are not a state. That has always been a misnomer. But they um, they can come out now and and announce that they're going to form something that is virtual. They can claim space online. They can recruit the same kinds of folks they've always recruited, who are these kind of you know digital um, digital hostile people, to their cause and and claim that they have ownership over territories that is simply ideological. I think I think we haven't seen the last of them. I do think we're going to see a fracturing of them. I I don't think we'll see IS. I think we'll see offshoots, and I think we'll see less of a global message, and I think we're going to see more localized messages, kind of a return almost to the AQ nationalist side, but, but with a generation that doesn't remember Al-Qaeda, really, but thinks it's invented it for themselves, again, inspired by what had been the, the Islamic State. So that's where I think we're, we're going with that. I mean, regardless of who is elected in the U.S. next November, we're, we could potentially be facing further U.S. withdrawal of troops because of this avoidance of conflict um, feeling of, among the U.S. population right now. Even the Democrats are saying we shouldn't be places anymore. And it's kind of, you know, based on people looking at the return on investment we have for years of lives and blood and treasure invested without necessarily achieving what the objectives were. And I think that will be used as a recruitment message by either Islamic State, Al Qaeda, or what I expect to be these more localized offshoots. Dr. Anthony, you had a comment? How do I get this to work? Just talk into it, it'll work. Okay, yes. Uh, very quickly, um, on the Iran side, uh, for those who think uh, they will withdraw, can be made to withdraw, uh, uh, cajole, coerced, uh, incentivized to withdraw, I don't see a chance at that at all. Why? Uh, Iran is on a roll and a run. Uh, in reaching the Mediterranean, it has recovered what it lost uh, thousands of years ago. It was an East Mediterranean power. It contested Greece. Um, this requires empathy and ego and psychology. What the Iranians have gained or regained and needs to be understood. Uh, perhaps it's a facetious analogy, but let's just say Mexico recovered Arizona and New Mexico and Southern California one way or another. Uh, there are maps in Mexico City you can purchase uh, which show uh, these states back under uh, Mexican control there. Uh, so let's not be naive about uh, what Iran has gained and what it is unlikely uh, uh, to relinquish. And the Hezbollah connection has been mentioned. Uh, Hezbollah is uh, on the ropes or in a corner in uh, Beirut, and uh, Ragida will explain that in greater uh, depth. On the other hand, uh, Hezbollah can say, look, we helped the Assad regime uh, remain. 
uh, we helped to consolidate his rule. And simultaneously, we worked with the Russians, we, we worked uh, with the Yemenis uh, to take the extra technology we have to help the Yemenis advance their Scud missiles uh, that can be shot into Saudi Arabia and elsewhere. Um, thirdly, with regard to the Russians, what did they gain? Two ports. Uh, since Peter the Great, Catherine the Great, they have longed for a warm water port. The ideal one is in uh, Iran, or in the uh, Iranian uh, uh, side of the uh, Gulf. Uh, with regard to Russian-Iranian collaboration, not extensive, uh, but significant there, uh, the chances for uh, Russia gaining uh, along the southern Iranian littoral in the Gulf is greater than it has uh, been in a long time. On Al-Qaeda, uh, because the fight has been against ISIS, uh, Al-Qaeda has been overlooked by some and uh, strengthened in various ways, especially in Yemen, in the southeastern part of Yemen, in Makala, in the Hadramat, in those areas. And as long as the Israeli-Palestinian uh, problem is unresolved and we look uh, uh, pathetic in terms of empathy, in terms of various humiliating insults, controversial, provocative, antagonistic steps that the administration has made. Now, this is food uh, for Al-Qaeda. It does not help to diminish that challenge that uh, they're on the right side of moral issues, ethical issues, and America's on the wrong side. Before I want to come to you, Rahida, about Hezbollah. But before we do, one more point, one more question about Iran from the audience. How should Iran's continued violations of the Iran nuclear agreement be dealt with? Sanctions have proven, in this questioner's opinion, to be ineffective. Should this be continued? It, yeah, no, sanctions have not been ineffective. I, I beg to differ. Sanctions have been extremely effective. And the Iranian situation, internal situation, is really in, at, at a boiling point. That is why we hear more threats, that they need to deal with the internal situation that is deteriorating due to sanctions. They, they are thinking the only way to deal with that is to have an outside engagement that will bring a sympathy to uh, to, to the regime from the public, the Iranian public. So no, it, sanctions are hurting badly. And it's a good policy that to continue with the sanctions. Do not think that it's time to ease up the sanctions because that really would be a deal-making, again, a fix-it uh, approach like what just happened with uh, Turkey. You know, fix it, uh, make an arrangement. Do not make arrangements. Stay the course because the other option really is to b bow to what the regime wants and then back to square one. Now, I know that some people will differ with me. They will just say, no, you need to have a, a, a mechanism to ease up in order to make sure that to open up the potential for dialogue. But remember, the message, it's not coming from Rouhani or Zarif. These are the, the, uh, what we thought would be the moderates in, in Iran. The message is coming from the uh, revolutionary guards who are saying, I am your address. You need to do what I want you to do. And that's, uh, and, and then, then if, you, if you don't release me from some sanctions, I'm gonna hurt you badly. I don't think it's time to pay back for blackmail. To the contrary, stay the course on sanctions. It's very important. It's leading to uh, important, uh, to, to, to detrimental, actually, positions uh, by hopefully, yeah, I wish I wish the Iranian regime would just decide that it's time and it's good for the Iranian people to take steps that would take to take steps that would would really become a reform of the regime. That you know, after 30, 40 years, what is why is it necessary to claim the right to have uh, paramilitary forces in other sovereign countries? It's time to just say no. This really didn't work. Let's back off. It's time that to, to adjust the logic of that regime. No one is saying Iran should 
be at war with us or we want to be at war with Iran. Take a look at the Gulf states. No one is really ready to go at, and, and, and provoke a war with Iran. The party that wants to provoke military operations is the Revolutionary Guards of Iran, not the United States, not the Arab states. And that's why we need to just sit back and take the, a look on, uh, at what should we be doing about that. Thank you. Tom. So, so again, I mean, um, uh, I want to put this in a larger context because the Middle East is not um, some outlier region. It's part of a larger thing going on. So this administration has chosen to take on two of the oldest civilizations on the planet at once, Iran, Persia, and China, basically. Uh, that's one of the signature features of the Trump administration. They've decided to take on Persia and China at the same time. And in effect, to use uh, sanctions against both of them, tariffs on China, uh, and oil sanctions on Persia. And I, I think, uh, I've actually supported both because I think there's a good case uh, for, for uh, creating that pressure. Um, the big question though is, um, uh, how do you want to use this leverage? Um, now, you know, one of the, I think, big questions about the Trump administration is that it's great at breaking things, but it has not actually proved its ability to actually make things um, uh, because breaking things um, uh, is rather easy, but um, making things actually requires compromising. Um, actually requires a coming to terms with the fact that you're not going to get 100%. And, um, uh, and so I would give you the analogy for both of these. So um, the only way, uh, I think a much more sophisticated approach to Iran would have been uh, to go, uh, now that we have actually uh, imposed these sanctions, I would be saying to uh, the Iranian government, and as uh, Rahida said, the, the Revolutionary Guards, here's what we want. We just want two things from you. Um, uh, the nuclear deal covered basically 15 years. We want to double that to 30. We want 30 years. And we want to ban on all missile testing um, to the radius of the Middle East. It's <clears throat> those two things. If you put those two things on the table to Tehran, you would mess them up. Oh, there, now then you'd have a very interesting fight inside the leadership. You'd have a really interesting fight. Because then, to the extent that there are moderates and, and, and hardliners, um, you would see a, a lot, as Wright said, we're, we're putting real pressure on them right yeah, but now. But Tom, these are yeah. on let the me, table. Let, let, these, these points are on the table. No, no, they're actually not. Um, um, they uh, Pence's um, um, uh, nine points are not. I'm talking about very focused, just two things. We have not told them. Uh, 15 years. We have told them an end to your nuclear program. Um, I would make it much more difficult for them. Because when you do that, what you do is you leverage the moderate forces inside on your side of the table. When you make it basically uh, an offer of lifting sanctions for regime change, then you force all the moderates to wave the nationalist flag. We're doing the exact same thing with the Chinese. Okay? We're forcing all the reformers inside China to rally to Xi Jinping because you're not putting an offer on the table that could actually entice enough people to fracture. So I, I, again, I, I think a much more sophisticated approach. They're great at creating pressure, this administration. I think they're very maladroit and often stupid about how to use that pressure in a sophisticated way to actually build fissures inside both Beijing and Tehran. Just one line, uh, Tom. I, I want to object to one thing to, in what you said. You said two things. You said. Only the ban on, on you spoke of the nuclear and the ballistic. Yeah. You did not even mention the uh, regional. That is really something that I would ask you to kindly always remember when you put these conditions out there. Thank you. Fighting her way through the traffic and getting here finally <clears throat> is the Right Honorable Mona Makram Abed, a distinguished lecturer of political science at the American University of Cairo a former member of the Egyptian Shura Council, their Senate, and a former member of the Egyptian People's Assembly, their Parliament, and I think soon to be a candidate for the Senate yet again. You're, you have some comments on this. I didn't hear what you said, but I will speak more about uh, what Tom has said just now, which I agree very much with. Uh, these are the things that today we have to see the alternative option if we don't want to go to war. Because we are on the brink of war in many, in many aspects, whether it is uh, 
Iran and Israel, whether it is uh, <coughs> the, the, the U.S. by proxy, etc. So we are on a very difficult uh, situation presently, and I don't think the time is to, uh, you know, brinkmanship. It's not the time. The time is to find the proper, not compromises, but the proper alternatives that we need, whether it is on the peace process, or whether it is uh, now on, <coughs> on the Gulf, and I will say some of the things that I have put as recommendations. Uh, <coughs> First of all, my, my talk was more on the US-Egyptian relations, how they have gone over time, and at the peak time was during Anwar Sadat, as we all know, <coughs> the peace process, the peace agreement, all this, what we would call the Kissinger era. What we're seeing today is a destruction of the Kissinger era, whether it is on the hope for a two-state solution for Palestine, whether it is a reconciliation with the Gulf countries, which I think is essential if we want to continue. Uh, uh, also, because the dispute uh, in the Gulf Cooperation Council is having very negative impact on the region today. And uh, it is also preventing all the parties to find an end to the conflict in Yemen. Uh, I also think that a return to the pursuit of an equitable resolution of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and the prospects for a breakthrough is necessary to preserve the hope for a two-state solution. Uh, we are now seeing the destruction of all the resolutions of the UN, the 242 resolution that were constructed in, 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 in the thing. And I believe that the alternative path that I'm suggesting could lead to a renovation of what Kissinger has started in the 1970s and which was to the, in, the great interest of the United States at the time. Uh, as for Egypt's relations now with the U.S., it is continuing on the same path as uh, Sadat's, which is a turn to Western direction, much more than it was during the Nasser time, and also a better relation with the Gulf countries, particularly Saudi Arabia. Today, the axis today in the region is Egypt and Saudi Arabia. This is an axis that has sustained all the ups and downs of the, of the turmoil after the uprisings of the turmoil of, uh, of the new Trump administration and so on. So what we're seeing today is that the withdrawal of the US troops, I thank God that Trump has re, is, 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 is rescinding that. I mean, not all the troops will be withdrawn, and this is a good sign. So this uh, has better prospects for the future. Thank you. Um, I want to shift, shift a little bit, and I want to bring up two countries that we haven't spent a lot of time talking about, Saudi Arabia and Israel. The, um, there's a, through all of these extraordinary questions that you've been filtering up here, there is a question about what do we think, let me start with Saudi Arabia. <clears throat> what do we think is going to happen be, uh, with Yemen and how will that affect American relations and what will be the lasting impact of the killing of Khashoggi? Will that have a lasting impact on American relations? Tom, let me start with you. Um, people here know more about Yemen than I do, so I'll just I'll, I'll defer to them. Um, you know, I, I think that um, again, let's start from the um, uh, thirty thousand feet. Um, uh, MBS didn't come from nowhere. Um, it came from an awareness within the Saudi system that um, uh, without radical reform. Uh, uh, in, in the economic, uh, social, and religious spheres. Uh, Saudi Arabia was gonna fall off the planet. Um, it was heading in a, in a really 
dangerous direction. It was, uh, its financial reserves were dwindling, um, and it had to find a way to uh, diversify its economy. The only way to diversify its economy was diversify education and empowering women um, uh, and, and modernizing government structures. So that was the context that um, uh, I, I always felt that if MBS didn't exist, the system would have invented him because it needed someone to take on this job. Um, uh, uh, unfortunately, you know, uh, I know a little too much about this story. Um, uh, so MBS had, had huge upside, uh, incredible energy, um, uh, unlike, uh, and he was ready to do really hard things, um, uh, not only uh, on the women driving thing, but uh, arresting uh, or, or you know, sidelining religious extremists. And, and uh, it got no notice, but um, eliminating male guardianship, which was like a huge story. Yeah. Um, in my view, none of his weenie cousins ever would have done that. Um, but the guy who had the same, uh, you know, um, a steel uh, uh, to do that um, also had some really bad impulses. Uh, he was the same guy who would uh, basically detain the Prime Minister of Lebanon, uh, cut off relations with Qatar, and um, uh, do the things, uh, the, the bombing campaign in Yemen. So by my view of MBS is he had a big upside um, and he had a big downside. And the job of American foreign policy was to encourage the upside and discourage the downside. And we, this administration, and it is this administration, completely failed in this task. It didn't even have an ambassador in Riyadh um, uh, for its basically first two years. You know, all of these governments in the Middle East um, are combinations of moderates and extremists. You know, um, uh, and that's the Israeli cabinet, the Palestinian cabinet, the Saudi cabinet. And historically, um, our role, the role of the American president, was to be the one who drew the red line and moderated the worst instincts. So that when they have a cabinet meeting and someone uh, uh, in Israel or the Arab world says, I'd like to do this really crazy thing. Uh, I'd like to annex the West Bank. Or I've got an idea. Let's murder uh, Jamal Khashoggi. Um, uh, the American president's uh, the role was always to be in the background where the king or the prime minister could say, I'd love to actually do that crazy thing that you're suggesting, but the American president broke my arm. He broke my arm. I'd love to, I'm with you, I'm totally with you. Love to do that crazy ass thing you're proposing, but the Americans would never let that happen. That's been our role. And we completely, this administration, utterly failed in that role. I guarantee you, you know, there was a meeting in Saudi Arabia one day, and somebody did say, I've got a really good idea. Let's lure Jamal Khashoggi into our consulate in Istanbul. Let's murder him and then chop him up. And there was nobody around the table, I guarantee you this, who said, what would Donald Trump say? Kirsten, you were in the White House. <clears throat> yes. Your thoughts? I would say that what, well, what I was looking for in my role after that event was a change in the decision making at the top levels in Saudi Arabia. So we saw that event as the result of a fractured system of good ideas reaching MBS. And we wanted to see wise advisors and, and top counsel being put back in place and pushing out, I will name people like Saad Katani from that decision making circle. Saad Katani was a red line for this administration. Get him out of that, get him out of earshot of MBS. We cannot have him having a, an influence on MBS anymore. Um, we also said we need the new National Security Center to work. We love that Saudi Arabia looked around at, at models here and other places, at national security councils and centers and such, and said we'd like to implement one of these ourselves, as we're seeing in other regional partners around the, around the world, or, or I'm sorry, around the region. We think this is great. And the point of this is to do this kind of collaborative consensus building, weeding out of bad ideas before it reaches a minister or a head of state. So we said, look, you've, you've taken the steps of trying to establish a national security center. Please make it work. What can we do to help you make this work? You've got an administrative level. You've got ministers at the top. Where's the center? Where are your, where are your subject matter experts? You know, every country represented here needs a strategic relationship with Saudi Arabia. 
And when, you, when you're dealing with a country where leaders are in charge for 50 years, you don't have the luxury of, of saying, we'll wait them out like you can with America. You can wait out one of our administrations. You can't wait out a, a, a monarch. So what you can do, though, is try to shape and guide and assist the reforms that are necessary, both the reforms that he might be trying to implement himself that we feel positively about, and the reforms that are necessary to make sure that he as a leader makes good decisions and not ill-informed decisions. Tom? Uh, just a, a quick follow-up, you know, because um, Saudi friends have asked me, so what, what does Saudi Arabia do now? And that's really was your question. And my, my first reaction is you cannot fix stupid. And when you do something as stupid as murdering Jamal Khashoggi, there is no fixing that stupid. There's only, the only thing you can hopefully do in time is reform your way out of this problem, to reduce basically the influence of that story because you have done so many domestic uh, reforms. And I think that's, that's really going to be the, the challenge for Saudi Arabia going forward. But the notion that this is just going to be forgotten, that's for a different era, Rick, OK? Um, because uh, I'm a big believer in the princes die rule of international relations. You may recall Princess Di once observed uh, a complaint that their problem of her marriage is that there were three people in my marriage, okay? Um, well, there's now three people in MBS's life, okay? Uh, there's Donald Trump, okay, metaphorically, the, the, uh, uh, his supporters, and, um, uh, and there's other governments that he might deal with, but there's now weaponized social media in every single country, and weaponized social media uh, in Europe, uh, in America will make it his life very, very difficult for a long time. It's not going to go away. Weaponized social media will not forget this. However, in Saudi Arabia, I don't think Khashoggi is a controversial, you know, I, I don't think MBS suffers from criticism. Yeah. Well, again, it, or, because or, that's, or, I think, or, because it, real reforms that have actually been enacted yeah. that Saudis have benefited from, particularly women. Shifting. Shifting. Let me ask you, because we're talking about uh, world leaders with a limited uh, arc. So what do we think is going to happen with Israel since Netanyahu doesn't seem to be able to get his government together? Will that, is the, are the prospects good for advances to be made? Is there, do you see a scenario where an Israeli government can come in and make a difference in terms of talks and negotiations? What do you think? Go ahead, Mona. I think this is one of the best uh, news that we have heard lately, which is the loss of Netanyahu's uh, government. Uh, we do, first of all, it will de-escalate the tensions that are there now because um, everything that was done lately, whether it was the annexation of the Golan Heights or the, the transfer of uh, the capital to Jerusalem, all this has uh, made the Palestinians unable and unwilling to go to the negotiating table when they were very close to it. I believe that now there is a real chance, and to, to uh, comment on what uh, Kristen has said, I think that today is the time for stepping up U.S. diplomacy and scaling back U.S. objectives to what can plausibly be accomplished uh, with the means available. And the means available today is to try to get uh, what's his name, Mohammed? Um, what's the leader of the Palestinian called? Abu Mazen. Uh, to get Abu Mazen to the negotiating table without the help of Kushner or MBS. Okay. Yeah, you're the boss. <laughs> no. Uh, back to the Saudi. Back to the Saudi Arabian Yemen one there. What's uh, Despite uh, the Jamal Khashoggi issue, despite uh, shale oil, uh, despite uh, a very negative overall uh, media uh, treatment of Saudi Arabia, uh, the relationship is not going to be more than frayed at the margins. I could be wrong on that, but I don't think so. There's 80 years of investment in this relationship on both sides. 
There are 500,000 Saudi Arabian graduates of American universities. No other country in the world has half that. Uh, and most of those are pro-American in the sense that in business, they prefer to have an American partner. They know American standards, weights, measures. Uh, they know English well. Uh, they have condominiums here. They vacation here. Uh, they urge their children, their nephews, their other relatives to come to school here. Uh, more than any other uh, Arab country, more than any other Islamic country. On the Arab and Islamic part, by default, Saudi Arabia has become the leader of the 22 Arab states. Iraq used to aspire to it, it's gone. Egypt used to aspire to it, gone. Syria used to aspire to it, gone. Uh, Libya under Gaddafi used to aspire to it, gone. There's no one left but Saudi Arabia. So we're talking about 22 countries, Arab countries, 28 Middle Eastern countries, but take Iran out of that because Iran is not led by Saudi Arabia. Of course, uh, axiomatic that. Uh, but on the Islamic world, uh, nearly two billion Muslims have to take Saudi Arabia seriously into their consideration. Not just for prayers five times a day among the pious, uh, but uh, the Hajj, the pilgrimage, which is obligatory uh, once in their lifetime. Now on the Yemen uh, situation, uh, empathy is required here. I've been to Yemen 25 times, met with its former president, Ali Abdullah Saleh, nine times here. Uh, there are these factors from Saudi Arabia's side. Uh, Yemen has a one of the longest borders of any two Arab countries in the region with Saudi Arabia. And from the Yemen side of the border, for the first time, not just um, human attacks, but drone attacks, scud attacks that have been advanced in that technology uh, there. Uh, just put yourself in the shoes of Mexico uh, or the United States vis-a-vis -vis Mexico, where Mexico doing something similar. So Saudi Arabia has no choice, no options. When you have no choice or options, your decision making is very easy. It will continue to be involved in Yemen. It's mistakes, yes. Messy, yes. Uh, civilian casualties, yes. What war is not messy, mistakes and civilian casualties. That's a tragic aspect of this. Uh, and secondly, uh, there's the concern that Yemen is a revolutionary political uh, nexus there. It toppled its monarchy. Third, it has had four revolutions, the late 40s, uh, 1962 to 1970, uh, 1994, and this one. Uh, it survived all of the previous ones, and I believe it will endure this particular one. The Yemeni population inside of Saudi Arabia, in Jeddah alone, I don't know what the percentage is, but let's just say a minimum of a third of those who do the burdens and, and do the physically arduous labor, uh, the socially uh, undignified labor. Uh, these are heavily rooted and based on the Yemeni populations. Lastly, Yemen's population is uh, pushing 30 million. It's greater than Kuwait, Bahrain, Qatar, the United Arab Emirates, and Oman three times over. Uh, so you cannot ignore if you're a Saudi Arabian, uh, the Yemen factor uh, in any of their regional uh, calculations. Rick, I just want to ask uh, right here a question because we're actually in the middle of an amazing uh, phenomena, which is we've seen mass protests on the streets of actually the two most democratic region, uh, countries in the region, Baghdad and Beirut. Mm -hmm. um, and we have not seen this before. What's going on? Yeah, thank you, Tom. I appreciate it because uh, I try to see uh, on American television and, and even in American papers coverage of what I witnessed in Beirut, and I just can't find it. And what's happening is that for the first time in Lebanon, I, I saw that and I see that grandmothers and grandchildren and, and, and they're walking together in the streets to say no to sectarianism anymore. In the past, they had the fear uh, of belong, of, of, well, they were afraid <coughs> to defy the Zaim, the, the, guide, the, the guy who guided them because they are minorities. There was this mi the bunch of minorities sitting there, each afraid uh, to, to say something, and they bowed. And then the ruling class became very greedy extremely greedy, 
and they just assume that this, these people will always remain uh, silent. And therefore, they went on making their deals, political deals and financial deals, where uh, the population was uh, looking at itself useless. No electricity deals at their expense, the water deals, the, 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 the hospitals, the uh, education. They were getting nothing where the upper ruling class, uh, political class, was pocketing, literally pocketing, uh, uh, and not implementing any reforms needed so that Lebanon can financially survive. So when the people went out on the streets, I want to tell you, you have to take a look at what, at what happened in Tripoli. Tripoli is the place where allegedly it's the extremists, the Sunni extremists are there all the time. Well. Hundreds of thousands were out there for six days. This is the seventh day, I think, that they are going to go back to the street. The same thing in 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 Nabatiyi, in Tyre. These people said for to Hassan Nasrallah, uh, the leader of Hezbollah. No, you won't. No, you won't come and wave your finger at us and tell us that you decide when to bring down a government or you decide. Uh, when a, a, a revolution is possible or a, or, or, or a manifestation in the street is allowed. And the Shiites, the Shiites of Lebanon dared say to both Hassan Nasrallah and Nabi Birri, their leaders, no, you won't. That is huge. That is tremendous. And the same thing, you know, there, there has been for days a million seven hundred thousand people in a country with a population of four to five million. Look at that number in the streets for seven days. And they said to Basad al-Hariri, the, the prime minister, what do you mean you come with the, your alleged reforms? And take a look at them. They, they, they were really laughable. And they said, you know, he said to them, these reforms are revolutionary. When they read them well, and they said, back at you and back to you. And they went back on the streets again. My, my point here is that there is a real awakening in Lebanon, which is really fabulous because it's saying to all those, um, you know, guys who assumed that they can run the country without the acquiescence of the people, and a very educated people at that, that, uh, that, that, the, 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 that they, they, they said no. They said, they will not, we will not fear you anymore. We will not be sectarian anymore. I saw, I mean, I was down in, 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 in the, one of the Sahat uh, al-Shuhada, I was down there, and you know, I found myself hugging and kissing women who were covered, uh, and it was just like the women, by the way, a lot of people spoke of the beautiful women of Beirut, of Lebanon, uh, in these demonstrations, in a way the Egyptians were making jokes about that, and uh, we, we found some of them rather offensive. Because it was not only about the pretty women of Lebanon demonstrating, it was women of Lebanon, all of them, old, young, covered, not covered, together, saying, no, we will not bow anymore. So please pay attention to Lebanon. We need you to, to go to the social media. It's everywhere. Because, you know, the television, and, and, and thank you, Tom, for, for allowing me to bring this up. But go follow what's going on. Support it, because it is something beautiful, another beautiful thing happening in that region after what happened in the Sudan. Thank you. Uh -huh. um, as we head into our last five minutes, it's gone quickly. Kirsten, let me ask you, the, um, do you see any possibility yeah, of the United States working with Baghdad? Uh, I'm sorry, work, working with Baghdad to limit Iran's involvement in what's going on. Do you, you see any possibility not? for us? Are you giving me the floor? No, Kirsten. No, Kirsten. Excuse me? Kirsten. Are you giving me the floor? You said Kirsten. No. Oh, Kirsten. Okay. Oh. Kirsten. <laughs> <laughs> Do you see any possibility for the United States to work with the, Ira with the Iranians to, to, to reach some kind of understanding about how they need to w work forward in the world, since they seem to be... With, the you're asking about Iran or with, or with Iraq? Both. In Iraq, it would be the U.S. administration's dream to be able to limit Iranian influence, obviously. And 
Um, but unfortunately, a lot of since they refuse to engage with quite a bit of the government, not with President Salah, that's fine, but with other other parts of the government that they see more as Iran-backed. You know, if you're not going to discuss things, then it makes it hard to get past them. But there, there's definitely a lot of thinking going on about um, ways to to limit Iran's influence there. They would all be experiments. Unfortunately, there is discussion about limiting security assistance to Iraq in, because of the fact that the Iranian-backed militias, while they are under the guidance of the Ministry of Defense in Iraq, still receive a lot of direction, many of them, from, um, from Qasem Soleimani and others in Iran. And the U.S. does not think it makes sense for taxpayer dollars to be spent in <coughs> arming and equipping and training groups that would be loyal to the IRGC. Is there any room for us to work with Baghdad in any of this? Absolutely, there is so much room to work with Baghdad. And, you know, if you are Baghdad and you're looking at, at who you should side with, you, the fact that the U.S. administration is asking you to make a binary decision, us or them, makes it difficult then to, to have those discussions. Um, there are, there are a lot of places we could, we could come, come together on things. There are places where we need Iran to, to give a little as well. You know, we need them to allow Iraq to rebuild its electricity sector in the south. You know, to give Iraq the ability to be a little more independent. Iran would like to keep Iraq kind of uh, as a vassal state. And we don't think that, that makes sense. I don't think anyone in this room think that's, thinks that makes sense. But, you know, there, there, there needs to be a recognition that Iraq is a country in the region with a relationship with a neighbor in Iran, and that, that there are places where both countries could probably have an influence that might not necessarily be to the detriment of the other. Um, I think there's, a, I don't know if we'll see that in this administration, but I think I would welcome uh, smart writers and other think tankers to be looking at this, because I think there are options. We just need to n nail down what those would be. In the four minutes we have left, are there any opportunities do you see coming up where we have a chance to talk to Tehran? Is there any way do you see Washington and Tehran somehow getting their acts together? The President, Donald Trump, would love to sit down with Tehran, but as we've seen with other such summits, they don't often come to anything. I think it's in Iran's interest right now, the way, the way I, from speaking to folks who talk to them, perceive their perception of their own interests, is that they think that keeping this low-boil, tit-for-tat escalation going is their, is their comfort zone, it's their happy place, at least through the election. There's no incentive in their opinion for them to come to the table with the President. If you are Rouhani and you come to the table and the summit comes to nothing, you look even weaker, you strengthen the hardliners. And um, unless we get a supreme leader to come to the table with the president, which would really be the decision maker with the decision maker, then we won't get anywhere. And I don't think a supreme leader believes that there's any incentive for him to sit down right now. Anyone else want to weigh in? Despite the advice I'm getting, I'm going to trust you all, starting with Mona. Can you take a minute, each of you, a minute, and leave us with the thought you think we should walk away with out of this conference? Make it less than a minute. Maybe it'll be better. One. What do you think? The minute is over. So I want to, personally, I'm very interested and very worried about Lebanon, much more than about Iran. And I think that, the U that it's not on the, on the radar of the U.S. And I think that what is happening today is a crisis of identity politics. And this is what is very important because it puts, it jeopardizes the whole Taif agreement, which was the agreement of sectarianism in, uh, in Lebanon and was done in 1989. Kirsten? Just ask very briefly that the region not give up on the U.S. That you know we we have perspective about the little bumps and obstacles we're seeing, and about perceptions of a U.S. lack of commitment. That nothing is forever. We've been through tough spots before. We'll get through this one. And uh, the relationship between the U.S., the West in general, and the region is is too meaningful, too powerful, and too longstanding to give up on. Rahida. I will add to what both Mona and Tristan said. I, I would add that uh, there really needs to be clarity in the U.S. position on the very important matters. And I want to thank Mona for pointing out to the Lebanese situation. 
although I'm not as worried as you are. I am worried, but I think for now, I, I want to look at the positive development that is the people coming together. Uh, but yes, uh, definitely we need to know what is the U.S. policy, and particularly that you have right now a, a call for the, the, for, for the resignation of the government, which means not only the prime minister and uh, his, gov his, his ministers, but also the president, who is in alliance with Hezbollah. This is called the Ahd. So uh, that, that ruling right now that's taking place is really uh, the strong men are uh, the president, who is not very awake, but his, his uh, son-in-law, who is the foreign minister, Gibran Basile, is very much running even the, the, the government as it goes now. So I think there has to be pressure for the resignation and re reform for, uh, for and forming a new direction, whatever it costs, because a new identity is being born from Lebanon and it's going to be post-sectarian with everybody's help. Thank you. I'm sorry, I thought you were talking about Washington for a minute, but I guess you were talking about Lebanon. Uh, and, uh, uh, Very interesting parallels. Tom? Well, when I began, I said I believe in amplification, um, and that not containment, not enlargement, but amplification should be the centerpiece of American foreign policy today. And that means amplifying the, the, the most decent and, and the most progressive uh, initiatives that come out of the region themselves. And I think the two most important documents to come out of the, uh, the Arab world uh, since the uh, 21st century began uh, is, or actually before the 20th century, this one, is the Taif Agreement. Because the, the core idea of Taif was politics can only be uh, sustained if we approach it with the principle of no victor, no vanquished, and the minority has to be overrepresented. Uh, it is the formula for power sharing for the entire region. And the second most important document written by Arab social scientists was the Arab Human Development Report in 2003, which said this region has three deficits, a deficit of education, a deficit of women's empowerment, and a deficit of freedom. And we, America, should be looking to amplify both of those uh, uh, concepts that emerge from the region. I think that's the necessary, if not sufficient, way to go forward. Tom, thank you. I, with that, I would like to thank our panel. I would like to thank Dr. Anthony. And I really would like to thank you. There are so many good questions in here, but like every conversation about the Middle East, you could go on for a long time, which is why I'm glad the conference runs more than a day. So uh, again, thank you very much, and uh, on to the next panel.